Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Uh, good morning. My name is Timothy Atik. I'm the director of Vertical Ministries in Waco, Texas. Vertical is a ministry on Baylor's campus, and it exists to ignite a passion in college students for Jesus Christ, his church in Waco, and his mission around the world. It's a joy to get to be here with you this morning. I'm so grateful for FaithBridge. This church has been just phenomenal in terms of how um, just supported we feel in Waco. So thank you for being behind us, believing in us, and uh, supporting the work God is is doing. It's, uh, it's been about a year since I've been here, and so I'll just be honest. As I was preparing for this morning, I just felt this, this pressure on me. Because it's been a year, I just felt like, man, I, I really want this morning uh, to be special. And so as I was thinking about what I wanted to share, I felt like uh, God led me to Genesis 36. Now, if you're familiar with your Bible at all, you might be thinking, well, I, uh, I know that the life of Joseph starts somewhere around the latter half of, of Genesis, and so if we're talking about Joseph, then, man, that'd be awesome. That, that's, that's an exciting story, so this might be uh, good. The life of Joseph actually begins in Genesis 37. Uh, Genesis 36 is, uh, is actually just a list of about 80-plus names. It's... Uh, it's the genealogy of Esau. So uh, you know those chapters in your Bible that you joyfully skip over when you're reading? Uh, that's where we're going this morning. Um, I'm basically going to open up the Hebrew phone book and just read. So that's... Uh, if you're a visitor this morning, welcome to Faith Ridge. You'll probably never see me again, but uh, anyway, it's been a good go and... Good to see you. Uh, the reality is this, this chapter in the Bible that we tend to, to gloss over has some truth in it that is going to demand movement from us. And I think that the best way that I can frame it is just by reminding you of a guy named Waldo. I don't know if you remember, where's Waldo? Um, he's uh, a guy who wore a striped sweater and a striped cap, and uh, as I was thinking about Waldo, here's the realization that I had about him. Waldo was always surrounded by people. He was always in the middle of a crowd, yet he was distinguishable. And as I thought about Waldo and I thought about what I want to talk about this morning, um, here's the realization that I came to. As believers in Jesus Christ, a lot like Waldo, we should be surrounded by people, yet we should be distinguishable. As believers in Jesus Christ, followers of Christ, we should be in the world, yet our lives should look different. They should. Why? Because Jesus Christ is in the business of radically changing lives. Genesis 36 is going to focus us in on three specific ways that our lives should look different. It is by no means an exhaustive list, but it is a convicting list of how our lives should look different because of Jesus. So if you have a Bible, I want you to join me uh, in Genesis chapter 36. If you don't have a Bible, there's people walking down the aisles now. If you'll just slip up your hand, they'd be happy to give you one. <clears throat> Genesis 36. And I'll just say, if you're here this morning and uh, you don't consider yourself a, a Christian, uh, I am so glad you're here. And here's what I hope happens for you. As I am calling the Christians in the room to a more authentic life with Christ, what I hope you hear is that life with Jesus Christ truly is worth it. <clears throat> so here we go, Genesis chapter 36. Let me read you verse 1. Verse 1 is really just going to 
uh, remind us of what we are getting ourselves into this morning. It says this, these are the generations of Esau, that is Edom. So Genesis 36 is really just a good overview of the life and family tree of Esau. Uh, if you're not really familiar with Esau, I'll, I'll just kind of try and explain real quick. Genesis is the book of beginnings, and it uh, primarily captures the lives of four individuals. There's, there's Abraham, and then there's Abraham's son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, and Jacob's son Joseph. Esau is the son of Isaac and the brother of Jacob. That's as far as I can get you right now, all right? But we're going to unpack a few details of his life as we move forward. What you need to know is that the life of Esau is really a great example of what life without God in this world can look like. So if you consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, I think it's safe to say your life should look different than Esau's life. Now let me just read you verse one again because there's a uh, brief phrase in parentheses that we might gloss over because it's in parentheses, but it actually uh, has very rich meaning. It says this, again, these are the generations of Esau, that is Edom. <clears throat> That's very important because Edom is another name for Esau and it literally means Red, And it is pointing us directly to the greatest failure of Esau's life. It points us back to Genesis 25, when Esau made the foolish decision to trade his birthright for a bowl of red stew. See, Esau is Edom. Edom literally means red. It's pointing us back to that red bowl of stew that he traded his birthright for. Just to fill you in on the story, if you don't recall it, uh, Esau was really in a sweet position because he was the firstborn son in his family and God had established this family structure where the firstborn son would receive a double portion of inheritance and the right to lead the family. Not only that, Esau's granddad was Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 12, God came to Abraham and he gave him three monumental blessings. And Esau, as the firstborn son, actually was in line to receive those significant blessings from his granddad, Abraham. But Esau, who was a hunter, went out, did his job, came home, and was extremely hungry and he stroke, struck up a bad deal with his deceitful brother Jacob, and he traded his birthright for a bowl of red stew. And that decision changed the trajectory of his life. See, in a moment in time, Esau allowed himself to be driven by his desire. And here's what he did. Please don't miss this. Esau chose the short-term gratification of his physical appetite over the long-term satisfaction of the physical and spiritual blessings of God. The result of that decision was massive amounts of regret. We get a taste of his regret in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17, the author of Hebrew puts it this way. He starts out by saying, don't be like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no chance to repent though he sought it with tears, large amounts of regret. Here's why this is important. We live in a world where short-term gratification is ultimate. It's the idea that if it feels good now, you should probably do it now. So if you want nicer clothes, nicer car, bigger house, but you really don't have the money to get those things, then the world would say that's the beauty of credit. That's why this world is full of that $30,000 millionaires, people who only make 30, 40, 50,000 dollars, but live as if they make millions. If you're single and your hormones are raging, the world would say there's no need to put in the time to cultivating, uh, cultivating a pure dating relationship that will end and also uh, begin a life of marriage. No, one night, purely physical, it's called a one night stand. 
If you're married and you don't feel like your needs are being met, then the world would say you can escape to fantasy worlds online. If you are having a tough day, week, month, year, decade, you're having a tough time emotionally, then the world would say you can pacify your pain with alcohol, drugs, prescription pills. We live in a world that says if it feels good now, you should probably do it now. Short-term gratification is ultimate. Here's the only problem. Often short-term gratification is followed up by long-term regret, and I would add on guilt and shame. That's why this world is full of broken people saying, I never should have cut corners at work. I never should have maxed out credit card after credit card after credit card. I never should have walked out on my family. I never should have cheated that person out of what was rightfully theirs. I never should have got involved with that guy or that girl. I never should have gotten connected with that group of people. Short-term gratification is often followed by long-term guilt, shame, and regret. As followers of Jesus Christ, our lives should look different. Our lives should have far less amounts of guilt, shame, and regret in them for two reasons. First, our lives should have far less amounts of guilt, shame, and regret because of the truth in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Listen to what Paul says. Paul uh, considered himself the chief of all sinners. And he said this, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When you express faith in Jesus Christ, when you open up your life and allow Jesus Christ to come in, then here's what happens. All of your failures, past, present, and future, are dealt with completely. They are washed away. So because of Jesus, you don't have to spend your life consumed by the fact that you've failed. You can spend your life consumed by the fact that you've been forgiven. That's the beauty of Christianity, is that when you are in Christ, your life is no longer defined by your failures. It is defined by Jesus' forgiveness. I'll put it another way. When you know Jesus Christ as Savior, your failures are no longer anchors of guilt, shame, and regret that you have to tow around. No, your failures are actually trophies of God's grace. And your failures display just how good, perfect, loving, and gracious God truly is. As followers of Christ, our lives should look different because we should have far less amounts of guilt, shame, and regret. There's no condemnation in Christ. The second reason we should have less amounts of guilt, shame, and regret is because of the truth in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Paul puts it this way. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. When you believe in Jesus, you are made completely new. You might not look new. That'd be nice. You, don't, you might not look new. You might not feel new, but you are new. Jesus described it to Nicodemus as being born again. I would imagine that there's some people here this morning who would love a new start in life. And Jesus is in the business of giving clean starts to messy lives. And one of the reasons that your life is so new when you know Jesus is because through faith in Christ, God actually comes and lives inside of you. That's the biggest difference. That's why you're so new. You go from a life without God to a life with God where God himself actually comes and establishes residence inside of you. That's why Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. I don't know if you've ever taken time to think about the fact that God actually lives inside of you and he doesn't want his presence in your life to be passive. He wants it to be extremely active. That's why he says, Paul tells us in Galatians 5 that it is God's intention to live a life through us that shows fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, 
faithfulness, and then there's this big one at the end, self-control. You want to know why our lives should look different? You want to know why we should have far less amounts of guilt, shame, and regret? Because God lives inside of us, and he's committed to leading us to the best life possible, a life full of joy. I'll explain it this way. Some of y'all might have heard me use this illustration before, but several years ago, I was watching a, a Japanese game show. If you've never seen one of those, it's basically the equivalent of Wipeout, if you've ever been channel surfing and stumbled across Wipeout. Um, but on this Japanese game show, contestants would run through this obstacle course, and there was this portion of the obstacle course where um, contestants would be running full speed, and uh, they would see four doors in front of them, and each door was covered by paper. And so as contestants are running, the goal is that they'd be running as fast as they can, and then they would just kind of eeny, meeny, miny, mo the door frames, pick one, run and burst through it, and keep on running. The only catch was that behind three of the four door frames were wooden beams. So... What you would see is contestant after contestant after contestant run as fast as they can, pick a door frame, run and jump through, and experience large amounts of regret. <laughs> now, as I watched, something changed halfway through the pool of contestants. Because what happened was the latter half of the pool of contestants learn from watching the front half. And so what, what started happening is that contestants would be running full speed and then when they got to the four door frames, they would just stop and begin to stare because what they realized is if they waited long enough, the sunlight would hit the paper and illuminate all the ways that led to regret in the one way that led to life. And as I thought about that, I said, that is Christ in us. Because when you know Jesus Christ and he lives inside of you, he illuminates life for you. And he shows you all the different ways that will lead to guilt, shame, and regret. And he leads you in the one way that brings life, joy, and peace. As followers of Jesus Christ, our lives should look different because Christ is in us, leading us away from decisions that bring guilt, shame, and regret and to decisions that bring peace, joy, and life. Our lives should look different. Let's continue in Genesis 36. <laughs> Verses two and three, here we go. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites, Adah, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, Aholibamah, the daughter of Anah, the daughter of Zibion, the Hivite, and Basemath, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Neboath. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I'd imagine many of you are going to claim those two verses as your life verses, just Genesis 36, 2 and 3, which God says, changed my life. Um, these two verses are just a list of names, but there's actually a lot of uh, significance to these two verses because these two verses tell us about the decisions that Esau made in marriage. And it, it really tells us two things. Number one, Esau rebelled against God's general design for marriage. God's general design for marriage is expressed in Genesis chapter 2, where he says a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. So God's design is that one man and one woman would become one emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Esau rebelled against that and took many wives. He rebelled against God's general design, and he rebelled against God's specific command tells us that he took wives from the Canaanites. God did not want his people taking wives from the Canaanites because the Canaanites did not know or honor God. Esau rebelled against God and his decisions regarding marriage and the result was vast amounts of drama that spilled over from his life into the lives 
of his family members. Go read about it in Genesis. Large amounts of drama. The reality is that people all throughout our world experience similar drama in their dating relationships and in their marriages. I firmly believe that some of the greatest amounts of pain, heartache, and bitterness that we can experience on this earth really come from decisions we make in either dating relationships or in marriage. As followers of Christ, our lives should look different. Our marriages should look different. We should have marriages that bring joy, not steal joy. And I'm going to say something that some of you guys aren't going to like, but I firmly believe that Christians should have the healthiest dating relationships and the healthiest marriages in the world. And I, uh, I need you to know, I can read minds, and I know what some of y'all are thinking, and you're right. I don't know what it's like to live with your spouse, all right? That's fair. <laughs> I don't. But I'll give you two reasons why I think we should have the healthiest marriages. Number one, if we say that we know Jesus Christ, do you know what we're saying? We are saying that we have experienced oceans of unconditional love, forgiveness, and commitment that the rest of the world doesn't even know about. What we are saying when we say that we know Jesus Christ is we are saying we have experienced someone loving us so deeply that they want to be with us despite all of our failures, all of our offensive tendencies, and all of our insecurities. When we say we know Jesus, we are saying that we have experienced such deep forgiveness that someone wants to be with us and he is willing to never bring up our failures, past, present, and future, ever again. When we say we know Jesus, we are saying that we have experienced someone being so committed to us that they actually laid down their life for us. Our marriages should look different because we have learned unconditional love, forgiveness, and commitment from the one who wrote the book on it. Second, our marriages should look different because we know the inventor of marriage. It was God's idea from the beginning. Marriage was God's idea, period. He's the one who thought up one man and one woman becoming one emotionally, spiritually, and Physically. The way things work in this world is if you invent something, then you know how it works best. Right? If you invent something, then you know how it works best, and we know the inventor. And the inventor has been so kind to us that he hasn't just thrown us the invention saying, hey, here's marriage, tinker with it and figure it out. No, he gave us marriage and then devoted an entire book of the Bible to Finding love, making love, and maintaining love. He gave us an instruction manual to the invention of marriage. It's called the Song of Solomon. Go read it if you're 18 or older. <laughs> but go read it. I mean, if you're, if you're single and you want to know what kind of guy or girl you should be looking for, the Song of Solomon tells you. If you're dating someone and you want to know how to have a relationship that feels like springtime, it's full of life, it tells you. If you want to know how to avoid a relationship that's more like winter where there's little to no signs of life, it tells you. If you're married and you want to have a better life of physical intimacy, hello guys who are asleep right now, uh, the Song of Solomon <laughs> tells you. Song and Solomon tells you how to fight well, and it tells you how to nurture a love that lasts a lifetime. See, our marriages should look different simply because we have access to the manual that unpacks for us exactly how to, to operate the machine of marriage well. Now, let me just clarify what I'm not saying when I say 
that I believe Christians should have the healthiest marriages in the world. Here's what I am not saying. I did not say that Christians should have perfect marriages. Go ask my wife. Call her up. She will tell you I've been very imperfect this week in marriage. (laughs) True story. I did not say that Christians should have the easiest marriages. Man, marriage can be tough. I said that we should have the healthiest marriages, and I just want to get real practical. Let me just tell you what I believe is one of the healthiest marriages in the world. One of the healthiest marriages out there is a man and a woman who are struggling to figure out life together, but they're saying, I'm committed to this. I'm committed to this, and if it means we have to go to counseling, I will go to counseling. I will lay down my pride and I will go. And if we go to counseling and we realize that two or three sessions isn't gonna take care of it and we have to be here for months, I'll be there for months. If we have to be there for years, I will be there for years. And on the days, or during the hours, the days, the weeks, and sometimes seasons that involve uh, months and even years where I don't feel in love for my spouse, I'm going to work hard and I'm going to ask God to give me the strength to choose to love my spouse. Why? Because this is the kind of love, forgiveness, and commitment we have experienced from Christ. So this is the type of love that we should express in marriage. This is why our relationships should look different. Let's continue on in Genesis 36. Verse four says this, in Ada bore to Esau, Eliphaz, base meth bore Reuel, in Aholibam bore Jeush, Jalem, and Korah. If you're pregnant right now, these are all great names to be considering. Just highlight them, <laughs> talk about them over lunch. These are the sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, all his beasts, all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan. He went into a land away from his brother Jacob, for their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. The land of their sojournings could not support them because of their livestock. So Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. So... What we find out is that Esau gets married, has a bunch of kids, moves to Seir, and then his family tree expands from there. We're not going to read any more of the chapter because it really is just a list of really hard to pronounce names. But if you were to go and read it and study it, here's what you would find. Verses 10 through 13 would show you that he had five sons and 12 grandsons. Uh, Verses 15 through 19 would show you uh, that some of his grandkids became political leaders. Verses 20 through 30 would show you that they were dominant. They took over districts. And then verses 31 through 39 would show you that some of Esau's descendants even became kings. This was the greatest accomplishment of Esau's family tree is that some of his descendants became kings and uh, Esau's family tree really turned into a kingdom, the kingdom of the Edomites. Unfortunately, we know that these kings, the descendants of Esau, did not know or honor God. We see that in different places in the Old Testament where the Edomites war against the nation of Israel, God's people. Consequently, the Edomite race ceased to exist in 70 AD. And this is very interesting, just think about it. Now, the only record, one of the only records we have of people who were once kings is a chapter that all of us skip over when we read the Bible. And it shows us something really important here. I think that there is this natural... um, there's this natural tendency in our society uh, to crave significance. There's this desire in us to race to the top 
of society. We long to be somebodies. We fear being nobodies. We talked about this last summer, but as Pastor Andy Stanley says, we, we spend our lives seeking after the er factor. We look around and we need to know that we are smarter, stronger, wealthier, funnier, prettier, successful er than the people around us. We fear being nobodies. But when you look at Esau's family tree and how, the, how things turned out for the kingdom of the Edomites, it shows us something very important. Even those of us who become somebodies in a moment in time will be nobodies. That's the way that the ocean tide of this world works. You spend your life building your castle, building your kingdom. In the moment you die, the ocean tide of this world comes and washes it all away. No one remembers that you were here. Someone moves onto the same plot of sand and begins building their castle. As followers of Jesus Christ, our lives should look different because our ambitions are now different. We're no longer spending our lives seeking the earth factor. We are spending our lives promoting the one who has the est factor. Jesus is strongest, lovingest, kindest. That's what our lives are now about. 2 Corinthians 5.20 tells us that Uh, As believers, we are now ambassadors for Christ. That means that when you express faith in Jesus, you are saved by Jesus, but then you are sent out by Jesus to go and proclaim not your name, but his name to the world. See, our lives, it's no longer about being famous, it's about being faithful. It's no longer about lifting up our names, it's about lifting up the name that is above every name, the name at which every knee will the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. See, our lives should look different because our ambitions are now different. The life of Esau makes one thing very clear. If we consider ourselves followers of Jesus Christ, our lives should look different. Why? Because we are different. We are different. We are those who have been forgiven. We are those who are indwelt by God himself. We are those who have learned unconditional love, forgiveness, and commitment from the one who wrote the book on all of these things. We are possessors of the instruction manual for marriage, and we are ambassadors for Christ, those who have been saved by Jesus and sent out by Jesus. Our lives should look different because we are different. And you know what? Please don't miss this. We are different to make a difference. We are different to make a difference. Not many people spend time asking the question, where's Waldo looking for him in books? But people are all around you in your neighborhoods, your work, your teams, your school. They're asking the question, where is joy found Where is peace found? Where is love found? Where is forgiveness found? Where is true life found? The hope is that they would find the answer, Jesus Christ, in us. But you need to know, and I hope you hear this, a Christian who is towing around anchors of guilt, shame, and regret, a Christian who refuses to submit various areas of life to the lordship of Jesus Christ, a Christian who is continually giving himself or herself over to short-term gratification, a Christian who refuses to love, forgive, and commit in marriage, a Christian who spends his life chasing the earth factor, is like Waldo without stripes. You are in the world and you look no different from it. Now, if we're honest, every single one of us is missing stripes in one way or another, right? We're all missing stripes in one way or another. We all struggle with hypocrisy in one way or another. If you're here this morning and you don't consider yourself a Christian, I wanna make an apology on behalf of all Christians We struggle with hypocrisy. 
and we will fail you, but you just need to know, we're not standing here this morning declaring that we're perfect. We are standing here declaring that we know the only one who has ever been perfect, and that's Jesus Christ. And we believe that Jesus Christ, his grace and forgiveness is big enough to cover over all of our hypocrisy. But the best thing that we can do this morning is take a step. It's the best thing we can do this morning is we can take a step. If you towed in guilt, shame, and regret this morning, leave it here. Leave it here. Maybe you have um, embraced God's forgiveness, but you've never really forgiven yourself. You know, the reason Jesus died and rose from the dead is so that you could experience complete forgiveness. And if you can embrace God's forgiveness, but you can't forgive yourself, you're missing out on half of it. He died for you to experience complete forgiveness. You walk out of here free this morning. Take a step. If there's very various areas of your life that you've been refusing to submit to his lordship and you've been giving yourself over to short-term gratification, Maybe this morning you just need to repent, ask for his forgiveness, and just um, submit those areas to him. Relinquish control over those areas of your life. Take a step. I mean, if we're honest, there are vast amounts of room for more love, forgiveness, and and commitment in every single marriage in this room. Take a step. If you've been spending your life chasing the earth factor, you know what? This morning, Jesus is just saying, I have so much more noble of a purpose for you. Take a step. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, here's what I hope you have heard this morning. What I hope you know is on the table is complete forgiveness. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done. This morning, Jesus Christ can offer you a brand new start complete forgiveness for all of your failures. That's on the table this morning. What's on the table this morning is that God himself doesn't want to sit in the sky and manage your life. No, he wants to move in and live life with you. That's what's on the table, a personal relationship with the God of the universe. If you've never come to a moment where you open up your heart, open up your life, and invite Jesus Christ to come in, and forgive you of your sins. Take a step. I'll end this morning by just asking all of us a simple question. What step are you gonna take today so that as a follower of Jesus Christ, your life can begin to look different? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as you know, we are all missing stripes in one way or another. And we praise you, Jesus, that what you accomplished on the cross when you died for the sins of the world, you were buried and you rose from the dead. What you accomplished has made it possible for us to have a relationship with you and experience your grace despite our failure and hypocrisy. Lord, we need you this morning. We need you to move and convict and illuminate our minds and hearts to truth, God. We want to be people who stand out in this world. We want to look different, not because it's manufactured, but because you are genuinely doing something inside of us, Lord. I pray specifically for every marriage in this room. God, marriage is, it is tough. It is. But Lord, you you can empower us to love as you have loved us. You can empower us to forgive and commit as you have forgiven and committed, Lord. And there is joy and fullness of life when we do marriage your way. So help us, God. We need your help. We love you. I pray that if there's anyone in here this morning that does not know you, may right in this moment, may they just open up their life, their heart, and would you come in. And may they leave here brand new this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Timothy Atik from Vertical Ministries in Waco, and he just brought a great message. Um, starting in Genesis 36, this uh, great overview of um, Esau and some very applicable points for all of us today. Um, I'm thinking, though, for somebody who maybe is not as familiar with the Bible, mm -hmm. um, if you could just kind of give us a little bit of background, a little bit of history, sort of leading up to the point where you started. Just a just an overview. Sure. So uh, Genesis is the book of beginnings. And so uh, there's creation, there's Adam and Eve, there's the fall of man in Genesis chapter three. Um, there's the flood where God kind of hits the reset button mm -hmm. on creation with Noah. Then there's the Tower of Babel where God kind of scatters, uh, kind of creates the nations. And then in Genesis chapter 12, um, God in his sovereignty chooses a man to, that he is going to basically establish his or orchestrate his plans mm -hmm. for history. He chooses uh, Abraham and he establishes the nation of Israel with Abraham and ultimately it's through Abraham's descendants that we would ultimately get Jesus and how God would, um, all of his plans point to Christ. So he, in Genesis chapter 12, he makes a few promises to Abraham. He promises Abraham to give him a piece of land and he promises to give him a lot of people, a family, uh, really a nation, to live on that land. And then he says, and in you, all the nations will be blessed. Mm. And that's talking about Jesus, that all of the world would have an opportunity to receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ. So that's where we picked up in the sermon that um, Abraham had a son named Isaac, Isaac. Mm -hmm. who had Jacob. Uh, and Esau was Jacob's brother, mm -hmm. Isaac's son. Great. Um, in this message, as you were able to look at um, just some of the mistakes and regrets that in Esau's life that led um, to his future, you were able to apply that to a lot of areas for us, um, just being different from the world in a lot of ways. And one area that you spoke really specifically to was our marriages. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure, um, as you acknowledge today, that there's a variety of marriages and marital situations that were in the audience today. Um, and I can't help thinking about, you know, in the in the hardest parts of marriage, sometimes you ask yourself, did I marry the wrong person? Mm -hmm. Or um, someone there sitting in there today may have been asking themselves that. And you did make a specific point about choosing to love. Can you speak more in into just that piece of marriage? Yeah, well, there's, um, you know, this is where Whereas where God's way and the world's way really kind of go in two totally different directions. Uh, our world paints a picture that marriage is primarily about your happiness, mm -hmm. that that's what it comes down to. And it's, uh, it, it breeds a sense of entitlement that you are entitled to be happy in your marriage and you are entitled to feel in love. And so... One of the reasons I think so many marriages end is because people reach a point where they don't feel like they're getting what they sense they're entitled to. And so they call it quits because they have fallen out of love. And, uh, and God has intended for marriage to really reflect the choice that Jesus made to pursue us when we were at the height of being unlovable sinful people and he sacrificed his life for us. And so um, I think one of the privileges God gives us is to feel in love with our spouse at times. But when you look at scripture, love is so much more of a choice. The, the famous love passage that is quoted at marriages is 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, mm -hmm. it's kind, it says love does not seek its own, it's not jealous. It endures all things. It believes all things. How often do you feel 
patient? Mm -hmm. How often do you feel kind? No, those are, those are intentional choices. So when, when you talk about being in love, I think when you tell someone, hey, when I tell my wife, I love you, what I'm saying is I am committing today to be patient and mm -hmm. kind. And that's, that's a choice. And I think um, the feeling in love follows the, the choice to love, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yes. And I think a lot of people don't feel in love just because they've given up on choosing to love long before that. You know, I, I think 1 Corinthians 13 is the stereotypical love passage, but I believe that the greatest passage that God has given us unpacking marital love is really in the Song of Solomon. It's in chapter 8, and it's, it says... Um, Love is as strong as death. It's as jealous as the grave. Um, even a, even um, a flood cannot quench its fire. And the idea there is that it's, it's, a, it's a commitment. When you stand on the altar, you don't even need to know what floods are going to come mm -hmm. from that day until the, until the end. You're, you're basically stepping in and making a decision that my love is as strong as death, meaning that, um, you know, no one died in uh, the, the, uh, the grave. It says that love is as jealous as the grave. Well, the grave doesn't share a body with anyone, if that makes sense. It does. And the idea is that that, that love is, is jealous. It's shared between two people and it's as strong as death, meaning that from today until the end, I'm, I'm going to make a choice. I don't need to see what's going to happen between now and and then because this is this is what I'm committing to. Does right. that make sense? It does. It does. And it's a very um, it's very challenging in marriage. Sure. And I feel like what was great about this message was there were so many different challenges for wherever you are in your walk, whether it's to commit to Christ today or to turn away from whatever in your life is your Esau mm -hmm. decision. So um, I thank you for being back with us today. It's a pleasure to have yeah, you back with us. And um, what a great message. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you for joining us here with, for Postscript and keep your questions coming. See you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.